Welcome to the Be Dadly Podcast, where we discuss all things dadly, from being an entrepreneur while caring for toddlers, to raising screenagers and talking the birds and the bees. We're here to help you traverse the vast and dynamic landscape of fatherhood. Enjoy practical advice, lots of puns, and even a few heart-touching moments. And the dad jokes are pretty good, too. And now your host, Brandon Jones. And just like that, we are back, folks. I am Brandon Jones, your host for the Be Dadly Podcast. Today, I have a very special guest. We're going to actually do something a little different here today. Uh, we're going to mix it up. So I've got Mike Fallett. Mike is not a father yet. We're going to put a yet in there. Uh, and we're going to maybe get into some of that with him. But the reason I wanted to have him on the show is that Mike is a serial entrepreneur. I know a lot of the dads listening are entrepreneurs, or they're trying to get a side hustle going. They really are hungry. They want to make more money. They want to do more for their family. And so I thought, you know what? Let me bring Mike on, pick his brain, and see what kind of good gold we can get out of it uh, for you guys, for the listeners, something that you could find useful. Uh, He has a lot of success here, and uh, he's obviously wildly popular as well. I noticed how many followers he has. Uh, on his uh, Facebook account is completely maxed out on friends. And so like many, many, many things that we would love to learn uh, from Mike. And so got him on the show today for us to do just that. Mike is the owner of Dream Starters Publishing, and uh, he's involved in a number of different companies. And he basically helps basically author books for people. He'd ghost write books for people or publish books, I should say, uh, for people, especially for people with businesses, uh, to help them build companies. And Mike's going to be able to describe this much better than I can. Uh, but Mike, thank you so much for being on the show with us. Hey, Brandon, thanks for having me. I love being the exception, not the role. I guess that's what <laughs> we're falling in line with today. It's great, man. So thanks for having me. Even though I'm not a father, I know the audience out there they're all dads. Uh, maybe I can give you some insight. Maybe I could show you a couple of things that I've seen work in many of my very successful clients who are family men. So uh, yeah, thrilled to be here, dude. Very cool. So tell me, so what is it exactly that you do? Um, you you kind of laid it on me before, and I, I might've hacked it up a little bit, but you publish books for business owners, entrepreneurs, freelancers, just people. Is that, is that the case? Yes. Yeah, so I read a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uh, 22 years Robert old. Robert Kiyosaki. Have you, have you read that before? Yes. Yes. Game changer. I get to yep. interview entrepreneurs all over the world. Many are multimillionaires. I'll ask them, Hey, what's a book that changed your life? They say rich dad, poor dad. Mm-hmm. And then I say, who read that or who wrote that book? And the answer that people say is Robert Kiyosaki. Right. However, it's kind of wrong. Oh, the interesting. real writer. The real writer is Sharon Lecter. Oh, interesting. Who would sit down with Kiyosaki and bring it to life on the page for him. So Kiyosaki's the master marketer. He's the magician. He's the branding expert. He's the one that's building many companies at once. The last thing he should do, just like the Donald Trumps of the world and the people who are like the Elon Musk, you really believe if you're worth that much money, you would actually sit down and do something as time consuming and as non-revenue producing as writing. And the answer is no. So Mm -hmm. I looked at that book. I saw how it was done. I said to myself, how can I make that accessible to the everyday entrepreneur? So I said, uh, okay, let me create a system and, and put it in place. I'll interview entrepreneurs all over the world. I'll break it down into two hour interviews one day, two hour interviews another day. I'll write the book for them based off of my team getting involved, listening to it, watching it. And then here we are. We can uh, get books done for people. We'll show them how to use it as a marketing tool to get it out there to create multiple revenue streams with courses, funnels, memberships, podcasts, apparel. And now all of a sudden you create many revenue streams based off of the book. Your moniker is what that book is about. So Brandon Jones, if you write a book about how to be the best dad ever, they're going to say, wow, Brandon, he's the best selling author of being the best dad ever. Let Mm. me check this out. I'll join his program, get his book for free. Now you have the data and say, hey, since you're interested in wanting to be the best dad ever, maybe you'll want to listen to my podcast. Maybe you'll want to join this program. Maybe you'll want to get this cool shirt that I'm making so you can wear it with your kids. And that's what we do for people. That is amazing. And is this something, I'm just curious, is this like, how expensive is this? (laughs) $10,000, half down, half on completion. 
Wow. So the super av- reasonable. Yep. The average ghostwriter like Sharon Lecter, let's just say if she were to sit down with you, there are right. many ghostwriters out there. The average process usually takes about a year and it's about forty five to one hundred thousand dollars because it's one person over a year asking you questions. I break everything down into 15 generic lessons, 15 specific stories, two hours one day, two hours another day. My team writes it in 30 days. So we're able to save a lot of time and a lot in costs. Yeah, that's super, super cool. You know, I, I had a uh, dinner with Ryan Holiday. Um, yeah, I wasn't the only person at dinner. It was a very large dinner, but he was a speaker. He was actually a keynote speaker while we were enjoying a dinner. It was super cool. And a great author, by the way. Um, so many great books. And especially if you're into stoicism, really great stuff. Ooh, I love it. Yeah. He's, I mean, yeah, the obstacle is the way is one of his, and there's just some really great books, but, uh, Ryan holiday told us at this dinner, um, he's by the way, published a lot of books. And for a guy that's, you know, around our age, my, you're 37, I'm 35 for a guy around our age. He's like one of the best, most published authors, like, like, all time. He's got super great books. They're all, you know, well-ranked. And uh, he said, you know, the key for him for writing and this great mentor, and I forget who his mentor was, but another amazing author, um, but was to basically write these headlines on flashcards. And you'd put these, they were, those would become these big, like pillars. You said, for example, 15 lessons, 15 stories kind of thing. You have a, you have a method, you've created a method for getting it out of people, Mm -hmm. you know, getting that, getting the, the story put together so that there is a, there is this story arc and they do get the the things that they need to uh, communicate to people. And Ryan's was, you know, you put this title basically on the top of a flashcard, just write down the biggest ideas you know of that are important for this subject. And then underneath that flashcard, you'll then put these bullet points of like, what is it? What do they need to know to understand that title? Mm -hmm. And then he he has you lay out all the flashcards on a table, or he suggested that we lay them on a, on a table and you organize your chapters basically. And then from there, you just go in and each day pull your card and work on the bullet points for that thing. And then after that, you've got a little manuscript. Beautiful. And I was like, man, that's that, that actually almost makes it feel like I could write a book, (laughs) which is crazy because it's, I've heard it's very challenging to write a book or at least to complete one, at least one that's any good. Well, our writing writers uh, spend about 110 hours per book, right? Uh, You know, they put together uh, about 120 pages, 20,000 to 25,000 words. It's a muscle that you need to work over mm-hmm. and over and over. So great writers, I always say, are even better listeners. And so a right. person who sits there and listens and pays attention to how they say something or what they're talking about when it comes to their dad teaching them a lesson, you can start to notice what's really important to them. And so a great writer will sit there and say, okay, there's something. Let me bring that to life. And the person speaking, the, the author, the, the client, might not even sense it because it's just part of their everyday life. You know, it's, oh, this is a mundane story to me, but it might be something that's lighting up their eyes or their voice. And Mm -hmm. so the writer will sit there, listen to it, bring it to life. And, uh, you know, 110 hours for a writer, that's a lot of time for an entrepreneur. What's your, right? what is your hourly rate in your mind? If you're not over a hundred or $200 an hour, something's wrong as an entrepreneur. And mm-hmm. so you can hire a writer. I mean, it's the book, Who Not How, if you've ever read that. It's mm-hmm. outsource your weaknesses, but also outsource what is a non-revenue producing activity for you. So you, the entrepreneur, you, the dad, can spend time with your family, but you can run your business. You can be the captain of your ship. And now you have other things working for you, which makes you omnipresent, which makes you the magician. And you just let the writers do what they do. And then you just keep focusing on building your brand, your image, keep posting, get yourself out there, get on podcasts because you are the face of the company. Now, where do you put these books? Like, how do you, and, and by the way, I don't want to skip over the, the piece that you said it's who, not how, um, that, that there's like a golden nugget there. I feel like it can easily be like, Oh, we just kind of moved right past that. You <laughs> had this fantastic entrepreneur, uh, or not entrepreneur. He was actually, um, 
He's actually the CEO of the largest real estate company in the world. He mentored me for quite a while. And he used to tell me all the time, um, it's a what, I'm sorry, it's a who, not what. It's a who, not how. Great. And so every time you hit an obstacle in your business, uh, it's, it's almost always a who. You, mm -hmm. Who do I need to know? Who do I need involved? Who do I need to help me? I understand this more, you know, and so many people go, Oh, what do I need to learn? Oh, how am I going to fix this? And they just hit the, sit there and stay in those loops and they hit their own ceilings of achievement, of growth, of development for their company. And, and so if they just get somebody else involved, someone else who has more perspective, some, and people are so willing to share. It's another thing too. People love to give great information. Generally I've, you know, every time I reach out to somebody, Hey, I'm a uh, struggle with this one part of this thing. And like, Oh man, let me tell you this. And they just like, will give you so much information. Yes. You know, people obviously. Give. Yeah. It's a, we, we have a, a give, a lot of us have a giving giver's heart, uh, that servant leadership type of mentality. So many of us do anyways. So anyways, I just wanted to make sure that golden nugget didn't get skipped over there. Cause that's a really, really, really important yes uh, who it, not how yes there's a book out there called who not how so if you guys mm. are looking for something to read this week or this weekend get it on audible mm. i'm a big fan of audible even more so than reading so that's mm -hmm. why i recommend anybody who writes a book with us they read their own book put it up on audible a lot of people i'm talking to are actually saying i like to listen to it as i read it think mm -hmm. about it okay if you can understand how you learn and the way i learn is by listening so totally i me like too. to read it but i think i accept more information every day i wake up i put on jordan peterson lectures i, I love him yeah <laughs> huge fan yeah Great fan. love guys, jordan peterson i'm like dude the clarity on that guy he's a laser beam and it laser it kills me when I watch his interviews with people that try to hack him up. And I'm like, dude, you just try to throw the guy on his heels the entire time. You're just gaslighting him everywhere. You just constantly, it's like, it's so frustrating to watch. Cause I mean, this could be such a good, you know, like they just want it to be controversial all the time, but Jordan is so awesome. I think he's got such a clear mind and yeah, we're blessed to have a guy like that. Like we are blessed. Like people don't like, He's Give a modern enough. day Socrates, man. If exactly. you guys don't realize that he's the, the Carl Jung of 2022, he's the Frederick Nietzsche of 2022. He yeah. is the, uh, you know, Freud of right now, accept it and, and, and enjoy what he's putting out there. It's yeah. amazing. And he's also authentic and humble about it too. He is, you know, he's not, he's not this like egotistical maniac that I feel like people, some of these people paint him to be. I'm like, you gotta be careful because I feel like the people that paint him that way, if you get into them, you're like, Oh, well, that's a person that is, I don't know if you know this, uh, who is bacon. Are you familiar with the bacon person? That was the body positive body movement person who she was, she, okay. So, so she, I'm going to get this, I'm going to get this mixed up, but here's, here's the rough, here's the rough outline. <laughs> This person is in charge of the positive body movement thing, right? And she's basically like, do you like be as big as you want to be, okay. be overweight, be obese, even if it's absolutely awful for you, just do whatever, right? So she's all about that movement. And then she decides to lose a bunch of weight, <laughs> which is like, oh, okay, well, maybe you decide to lose a bunch of weight. Then she decides she's not a she anymore. So she becomes Kevin Bacon or whatever. <laughs> Kevin, is it Kevin Bacon? Cause Kevin Bacon is not like a movie star, something like this. And then, and then she, so she becomes a, 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 a he, um, you know, becomes is kind of whatever portrays yeah, herself as a male. That. Yeah. Air quotes on becomes. And then, uh, and then she basically, she's, she's even known for doing this thing called flapping. And flapping, she says she does this so that people know that she's on a spectrum. Now, people that are on the spectrum that do things like flapping don't have to pretend that they're doing it. She wants people to know so that they can more easily identify her with her. I'm like, dude, these are the kind, and these are, and she's basically going around teaching diversity training, teaching all these things and being the kind of person that would slander Jordan Peterson. You're like, you, it, 
who would you listen to here? This man who's coherent, authentic, and being real about like his struggles and also his wisdom, or this person who's literally going through identity crisis after identity crisis after identity crisis while telling you what you should think. Man, that is scary. <laughs> I mean, you are the product of who you surround yourself, the books you read, and who you listen to. And so if someone were to sit down and actually listen to that individual, they're going to mm -hmm. be more confused. And they exactly. are going to lead themselves into so much danger in this world because a person who's confused, who doesn't know who they are or what they want or, you know, what they stand for. I mean, this person seems like it's just constantly morphing based off of what will get me attention. That's, That's scary, what man. it does. It does seem like it's attention seeking. You know, I tell you, Mike, I, I used to go so far into like just reading all the stuff and, you know, I learned about her, him, whatever, uh, I guess it's been a few years ago. That's why my memory is like, I'm not going to hold that. I'm not going to hold all those facts because it's just not worth it for me. Uh, but also I've kind of got to a place, man, where I feel like you can go into this well of, of information, right. And you can keep going back there, but it's kind of a poisonous well. And if you keep drinking the poisonous well, you're going to be back with your family sick. Like you're going to be back with your work depressed. You're not going to feel like as on fire as you could feel. feel. So for me, I, I, I have kind of stopped a little bit because I used to, for example, spend my later hours of the night going and like going basically down the rabbit hole, which is important because I feel like I needed to know. Yes. <clears throat> I needed to know what was you needed up. to come I needed out of the cave. You needed I needed to, come to know out. for my family. I needed to know for my future. I needed to know. I needed to understand. So I went digging and digging and digging and looking at all these different angles. And, uh, you know, I'm a prepper. I've got, you know, basically food supply. I've got water supply. We've always got tons and tons of water. Um, Love I've it. got ammunition for days. I've got, you know, plenty of I've got a small arsenal. Um, I have cameras set up on the <laughs> fence post, the front, the back. I've got them in my house. I just basically have it set up. And it's just because I'm like, hey, look, if I don't want to be the guy caught with his pants down if some doomsday were to happen. I also drive a very big Tundra that has a Corolla eater for a bumper. Um, and I, I'm, I'm kind of a stereotypical guy in that way. But I'm also, I'm also... I'm not, that's just not, that's not all me. Like people could pigeonhole me in to be like, that's, oh, I know his type. You don't because here's the deal. I have a really big heart. I used to run a company in Austin called good society and good society was about basically helping the world become a better place through personal development. It was about basically saying, Hey, stop pointing the finger. Don't look outside yourself for the problems because it's trust it's me, yes. you've got it inside the, 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 your own trauma, your own makeup, and like all the things that you're working through, man, they're, they're happening out here. They're being expressed outwardly. So like, let's clean up our side of the street. And that was what it was all about. Um, and still is, but we haven't been doing very much since COVID actually really hit us hard. And I lost an investor, lost a small team, and it was just tough. It was a really tough time for us and I haven't really picked that project back up. But the point is that like we were doing all kinds of stuff. We were talking about sexuality. We were having group contemplative, like contemplative dialogues where we we're exploring really important topics. And uh, though that kind of space that I was holding, for example, with the, with those people, that's not the kind of space that if you see a guy driving by you in a big giant tundra, uh, you know, and you know, you, you see if, for example, if it had a back, the blue sticker or something like that on the back, you're like, and be like, oh, I know exactly what that guy's like. Yep. No, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. All you know is the truck he drives, you know what I mean? Like you don't know his heart. You don't know what's in, in his head. And, uh, so Mike, I can obviously, I see the 1776, um, right there behind you. Mm -hmm. And I've also seen, by the way, guys, I want you to check out Mike Fallett's, uh, Facebook, because if you want to see the funniest memes ever, <laughs> you're a meme generator, dude. These are awesome. Are you making these? Yeah, most of them I do make. Somehow I'll come across them and maybe spin them to something that's a little bit more, you know, my taste. But uh, dude, I, yeah, 2020 was the greatest thing for my creative mind. I could, I saw a, a divide in the world and I saw just total insanity. And I'm telling you, these are all gifts. Uh, when the world gives you this, this uh, maybe new life, this new sense of energy, 
yeah. use it to your advantage and you can use it through humor. You could use it through maybe propelling yourself into different businesses or leaving that corporate job. But, you know, as a Brazilian jujitsu, like I, I'm not into that, but I study how those people think mm -hmm. and when energy, you don't fight it at all. You use right. it against that individual or you use it against that entity. So I have a lot of fun with it. And I think anybody out there, rather than get angry and hurt yourself, you use it to your advantage and have a lot of fun with it. Yeah. You have some great memes. I definitely, I want to encourage everybody to check, check it out. Um, and so, you know, the Aikido, me and my son studied Aikido. We, we used to go to Aikido and, um, that was one of the lessons that we learned in it is it, we learned this first thing about flowing with the river. Mm -hmm. basically going with the river. Uh, if you fight up the river, man, it's a losing battle, right? Like you could swim for days, but if the river's turning, you're not going to go anywhere, right? It's better to float down the river. And so with that being said, uh, they would teach us this thing. Like, well, let's say somebody is trying to impale you with like a knife, right? If I, if I shrug up and I flex and I like, you know, shift my body, like I'm going to try to hold it. I get penetrated with that blade. But if I actually allow the movement of them coming towards me and I rotate the exact counter is already generated. Like, let's say that they went from my shoulder or they went from my chest and I yeah. rotated left shoulder, my right shoulder is rotating towards them. And now you have so energy. the counter happens simultaneous to you being willing to accept Wow. So as you accept, you give, and it's like a rotation, it's rotating on itself. And the keto guys are like masters at that. The jujitsu guys are masters at that. You throw them into one thing. They've, you slipped into their next thing. You're like, how did this happen? <laughs> it's like, well, they allowed you to move that and let them go. And then they, they've got you in another motion. Yeah. It's, and if you try to hide or stop it, right? Like if you hide from it, it's only going to just get bottled up inside of you. And it's only going to be like that, that drop of poison inside. Like you need to release it. If something's given to you, something's got to go, something's mm -hmm. got to be pushed back. And uh, I, I just, I take that to heart when it comes to business, I am not letting all this insanity go to waste. Mm -hmm. I'm using all of it to get smarter, more creative, financially more successful. I am using all of what happened in 2020 to just implement way more revenue streams. So, Hey, you're going to increase inflation. No worries. I can't stop that. But what I can do is increase 10 more revenue streams within the next six months to prepare mm -hmm. myself for what's coming down the bike. Hey, you know what? You're going to get uh, into this uh, office. Well, day one, I went out and bought more guns. Day one on 20, 20, 2021, January 20th, 2021, went out and bought more stuff. So, okay, mm -hmm. this is what's going to happen. I'm going to prepare myself even more. Thank you. Right. But right. that's how you look at it. Anything, anybody coming after you or any, any, type of negativity or even that, uh, sense of, uh, you know, evil mm -hmm. hit against it. And, um, I, I think that, um, it, it's all depends on how you things happen to you or uh, for you, not to you. Totally. So that could be the greatest thing for you, all of it, no matter what happens. Yes. Yeah. Actually the last podcast we had, we were just talking about that. I I'm a big believer that things are happening for us, not to us. And Bingo. I think that it, that's the kind of, if you take that perspective, life, every curveball life throws at you as an opportunity. Every one of them has the, has growth within it. Right. And, uh, and if that's the case on the micro, which is you and I have that as our own personal perspective, but if you have that happening to you, things are happening for you, not to you. Then on the larger scale, what's happening now is the greatest opportunity for mankind to awaken, shift, move. Yes. It's the greatest opportunity ever. Not the worst. It's the greatest. Greatest. Yeah. By and far. actually in if speaking, we've touched on stoicism just lightly, but it, speaking of stoicism, there's kind of the belief of, of the stoics is that the challenges are gifts from the God, the gods rather, uh, not one God, but they, they're, they're gifts from gods. And basically these challenges are opportunities for you to like earn the adornment and the love of the gods and the favor of them. Mm -hmm. And, and so you're going to be challenged and that's a moment. Can you rise to the challenge? Can you meet the challenge? Uh, can you show the skills that you've developed so far? Can you bring yourself to full life? Which I think a lot of us are sometimes just a little bit dormant and asleep. It's like this thing kind of shook us up. At least I know for me, it's, it, it totally made me like this brand. I 
never would have thought I was going to coach dads. I mean, ever, ever, never, ever. First of all, I'm a very young dad. I have a 16 year old. I'm 35 years old. I had wow, kid at 19 dude. years old at 24. I got custody of at five years old and he was expelled from kindergarten and he was a handful. And I never in my life thought that all the therapy him and I had to go through all the coaching I needed. Cause I was such a piece of shit, all the triggered stuff that I had to work through all of my personal addictions. I had to get over all of those things things would culminate to me helping other dads. I was like, never thought that in 2020 and 2021 is where I got shifted. God's like, Hey, I want to show you something. This is something you need to share back with these guys. You need to, you need to talk about your journey. You need to share what you learned because I used to say, for example, and this is years before I have, I have empathy for the angry man. <laughs> I have empathy for the impatient man. I know what it is like to be angry and impatient. I am like the king of being both of those. And I totally empathize so much. I know what it's like, just be like, or even go, can't you fucking see it? It's so clear, <laughs> you know, and you just go, man, can you not see what I'm showing you here? And so uh, I have all that for, you know, for days. And, and so it ended up becoming the thing is like in 2020 and 2021, it's like, Hey, this is what your new, your new path is going to be. So hey, real quick, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Well, we talked a little bit before we hit the record button about the allegory of the cave. What you just said there yes. is okay. Once you, once you are ripped out of your old being and like, you're able to see like, Oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. you doing. Oh, this is the truth. You know, it's all about the, the search for the truth. And so uh, the allegory of the cave written by Plato 20 years after Socrates died. If you guys don't know this, just look it up. It's a quick read. Anyways, it's the original story of like the Matrix. And what it says in its uh, in a quick little summary is that there were four different prisoners locked up from the day they were born all the way till they were like 20, 30 years old, you know, till they're to it manhood, I believe is the way they put it. And so they're all caged up and they couldn't see anything except what was in front of them, which was just a wall, their whole lives. And behind them was an opening to the, uh, to the surface. And it was just like this one big cave. And there were people who were controlling everything that they were seeing through shadows. So they would hold up puppets and they would hold up other things. And, and, and the prisoners were locked. They couldn't move their necks. So they couldn't even tell where they were at. They were fed their whole lives. They would see this stuff on the wall and then they would call it what, it, what they thought it was. Oh, that's a donkey. Oh, that's a horse. That's this. Well, one day, one of the prisoners escapes, somehow gets loose and goes to the surface. And as he goes to the surface, his eyes are blinded. He sees the light. He sees the sun. He sees that they were in a cave their whole lives. And now he meets different people. He sees that the shadows that they were calling animals and donkeys were not actually donkeys and shadows and or donkeys and horses and animals and all that. So he's in all this pain from his eyes, from seeing the light. He's starting to, you know, feel all of the, the, the insecurity of being wrong his whole life. Mm. He runs back down into the cave and says, Hey guys, just to let you know, everything we've seen is wrong. This is, we're actually prisoners. There's a lot of freedom up there and the prisoners get angry at him. They want to kill him. How dare you say that we're locked up and we're prisoners for our lives. This is safety. This is comfort. We now are fed for the rest of our lives sitting right here and we're entertained. This is a blessing. How dare you want to take us out of here? And then, so they said, okay, so tell me what you see on these, uh, th these walls. And he says, my eyes, I can't really, they're distorted. The light kind of blind me, blinded me from even coming down here. I can't even see those shadows anymore. And they say, see, you are now corrupted. You are the one that is lying to us. How dare anybody come down and try to unlock our chains to go to the surface? And it just goes to show you, once you escape the cave and you go to the surface, you figure out what's the truth, who you really are and what life is all about. And you try to go back to someone who is in your old spot. They're going to want to kill you. They're going to be angry at you. And so it's almost it's impossible. And I believe Jordan Peterson talks about this. You can't wake those people up until they're ready to unlock the chains themselves. Only then you can be of assistance and you can serve them 
in life. And it has, has to happen with people in victimhood or people with addiction. You mm-hmm. cannot change them. They have to be ready to accept it. You yeah, man, that is such a powerful story and so relevant too for today. And I used to work in habit coaching and I, I worked with a bunch of guys with different addictions. And I worked, for example, for a, a young man that his parents said, I, we need you to help with this young man. I remember the first day he came in, as soon as they left out the room, I said, hey, bud, uh, just so you know, uh, I'm not interested in being your coach unless you're interested in having one. And he was like, uh, okay. And I was like, if you're in here for them, we're not going to get anywhere. 100%. This isn't going to work for you. I can assure you with everything I've got, I know this will be a failing opportunity for both of us. And with that said, you watch sports. He's like, yeah. And I was like, have you ever had a coach? He's like, I mean, I played you know basketball when I was younger. I said, yeah. Have you ever had a personal coach? And he's like, no. And I'm like, well, think of it like sports. We got goals. I'm going to see your potential. I'm going to make sure you hit your goals. Do you want that? And he's like, yeah, I could do that. I'll do that. I said, all right, well, let's give this a shot then. And literally we got him there, but I know for a fact that I did that because his parents were pushing him in the door. We would have gotten nowhere. Amazing. And you know, one of the things I've learned about you, you were saying like, it's really hard to reach them. And it so is, it's so hard to go back to people who don't see it. I remember when I first had my mind, like awaken, I remember trying to talk people about it. (laughs) They were just not having it, man. They were like, dude, what? I'm trying to go to work. Like, dude, what are you talking about? Like, I was just like, no, it's rigged, man. The IRS is a total scam. It's all out to get you, man. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, they just were not having it. And uh, there's this really, there's this really, really um, great method. And I've, I've seen it show up. It it shows up in a lot of different places, but you might know it from seven habits of highly effective people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cubby. And that is uh, seek first to understand and then to be understood. And one of the things that I've learned when it comes to sharing those truths is that if you will start with like where they're at in terms of like understanding like, Hey, you know how we're kind of really frustrated with like how much tax that, you know, we have to pay and how it feels like the rich guys always seem to get out of things and how they get bailed out. And you know how we're always like, you know, kind of upset about that and, you know, kind of understand like getting on their level. They're like, yeah, looking, yeah, I do. And I'm like, yeah, did you know that that's rigged? <laughs> like, <laughs> as, long as, as long as you start with helping get to the, get, be with them on some level before you take, take the, the step. Cause a lot of times you just come and write at, it, understand me, understand what I had to say and what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling. And it's like just taking a moment to say, Hey, look, let me see where they're at. And then let me see if I can get on that level first so that then we can elevate together. It's a very different experience and, and trajectory um, with that. I've got to ask method. It's the Socratic, the Socratic method. Socratic method. And yeah, it's Socratic method. Ask, ask, just ask, don't tell. Ask, That's don't another tell. thing is you can really, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, not necessarily lead the witness, but you can ask them questions and get them along the path. I'm going to ask you some questions. I got some questions for you. Yeah. How the hell did you become so popular? How did you get 5,000 friends and how did you get all these followers and what did you do? Like you're a young guy, but what, what did you do to generate all of that attention? Well, I think it started off with uh, me taking a stand for what I really believed in. Uh, mm. 2019, 2018, I guess is probably, so I'll, get, I'll take you back to the very beginning. Um, 2008, I started a business, got my real estate license after reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad, bought my first 40 unit building, started four different businesses afterwards, screwed up magnificently, went into severe debt, started a fifth business called uh, Doggy Surprise. It was a direct to home dog product service. Here I am with a somewhat successful business. By the way, the way I defined successful back then was I was making more than I was spending. So I was probably making about $40,000 a year. Okay. Here I am with a successful startup for the very first time. People started coming to me saying, Hey, can you help me start a business? I said, you know what, why don't I just write a book about this? Okay. Maybe I'll be able to turn it into an Amazon bestseller. So in 2015, I wrote a book, put it up on Amazon, became an Amazon bestseller. I thought I would get a lot of clients when it comes to helping them start businesses. Turned out it was people more interested in how I wrote the book. 
oh, mm. man, you put out a book. Can you help me do the exact same thing? And mm. I turned that into a business and I struggled insanely for about two years, just up and down, you know, like, you know, couldn't sleep at night eating eggs and bananas pretty much all day, every day. So 2017, I started getting into the, uh, you know, the marketing world of, I need to really stand out. I need to do something because I have no money, really. I'm just getting by. I'm just keeping the lights on. I'm just keeping my house. Why don't I start to hire models and have some type of sex appeal to my brand? All right. I'll create some book business around your story is the most attractive part about you. Okay, well, let me just hire a bunch of models. And I just went through a breakup. So it gave me this feel of like, all right, I need to just, I need to create this new identity. All right, I'm this basic book guy that helps people. Why don't I become like this, like Dan Bilzerian of books or right. Hefner of books or <laughs> Ty Lopez of books? Because that would capture some attention. Crazy enough, more women wanted to become my clients than men. It was just insane what I saw. So I started sending women shoes, Steve Madden, red pumps, and in offering incentives, if you get a tattoo of my phrase for my company on your body, I'll give you a discount for the book. And I started getting all these clever ideas put together and it started to grow hmm. 2017, 18, somewhere in there, it starts to roll up. And then I said, you know what? I'm done with all this politics stuff. I'm going to start fighting back at a high level. So 2018, 2019, I start putting myself out there of what I really believe when it comes to politics. Mm -hmm. So you combine sex appeal with the idea of saying stuff that's somewhat controversial. Uh, all of a sudden, I started segmenting my audience, audiences. Some people didn't like the sex appeal. They went away. Some people mm -hmm. loved it. They were drawn to me. Some people hated what I was saying when it comes to politics. Some people truly loved it. Mm -hmm. Now you enter 2020, and I had one revenue stream, which was Dream Starters Publishing. And whenever all the stuff hit the fan, I dove into the political world even more. I started getting out and putting myself all over the place, what I really believed. What happened then was insane. The people who want to say what I was saying were drawn to me. Hey, man, mm -hmm. I love your courage. I love what you're saying. I want to do a book with you. It wasn't even like, let me go talk to other competitors. It was, I love what you stand for. I'm with you. And it mm -hmm. wasn't just about building clients. And now I was creating allies. And so I realized that now I need to create a membership, a group somehow to consolidate all these patriot entrepreneurs in one spot. I created a thing called the inner circle. I started joining many masterminds. And uh, once I would join these masterminds, whether it was the DM Alliance, I'm wearing the hat right here, Legacy Boardroom, Arate, 365 Driven, Not Most People, Cash, Cash Profit Accelerator. I mean, I'm a part of many different masterminds. That was the, uh, I, I would say the tipping point. I think it's a Malcolm Gladwell book. The tipping mm -hmm. point to spilling off into not only more clients, but more allies and way more businesses. I just started scaling revenue stream after revenue stream. People believed in me more because they knew, they knew me. It wasn't like they had to know the business. They know Mike is a no bullshit guy and he's going to say what he really feels. There's no masks anymore when it comes to Mike. He tells it like it is. If you don't like him, don't follow him. If you do, follow him and maybe work with him. But you know what you're getting. And I would say that was the key to my success. So, you know, it, it all goes back. They say that marketing is a magnet. It works two ways, right? It attracts and it repels. Mm -hmm. And so you were using your stance on world events and on just the political scene to say, Hey, this is what I really believe in. And then you attracted and repelled both at the same time, uh, through that messaging. How did, for me, I got, so I'll give you, I got canceled basically, essentially on Facebook. I had to start a whole new account to run ads. I was basically told I couldn't run ads anymore. And I appealed it. I was like, oh, what, why? Like, what's this whole thing? And I had been posting political stuff and I ended up getting, they, they basically shut down my ad account. Could do any more business management stuff I'm with on you. To Facebook. Be. Super freaking frustrating. Um, did you ever have any fear of that? Like being can't like cancel stuff, like any of that? Cause it was, it was driving your business. Yeah. I mean, my Facebook page shut down for months at a time. It, it was scary, you know, but then I started thinking, okay, I'm doing something right. Right. Like I look at totally. everything as a test. I think so too. Yeah. I'm doing, this is all a test. If I'm putting this out there, it's not going to deter me. I may do things in a different way. So I'm a little bit more, uh, uh, I guess you could say under the, the radar, 
But mm-hmm. I started thinking, okay, well, if this is happening, you know what I'll do? I'll cut through all the noise. I'll just join more masterminds. Mm-hmm. I'll start to kind of position myself in rooms and start to use Zoom as my main go-to. Hey, let's just jump on a call. I Maybe mm-hmm. I'll create a separate account and I'll be a little bit easier on the politics on that one, but they'll still know it's me. And I'll just say, hey, my other account is, is, is shut down. People were following me. Warnings were popping up saying, hey, this guy puts out misinformation or whatever. Are you sure you want to follow him? Right. The moment that was popping up on the right people screens, they said, hey, yeah. he's put out true guy that I want in my exactly. life. Exactly. <laughs> I know. The moment I saw that, I'm like, yeah, you might want to pay attention to whatever they just said was misinformation. <laughs> yeah. um, man, so much good stuff. So let me ask you this question. Like, what's the coolest thing you've had the opportunity to do uh, since you've networked this way, since you put yourself in all these opportunities? Give me one of the coolest things you've had the opportunity to do putting yourself out there like that. oh man uh you know when people see who you really are they trust in you more it's like you the more you know yourself the more you know who you want in your world uh the other people out there who are very valuable individuals will see that and say that's the type of individual you know private jet flights uh private yacht trips uh speaking uh, i'll be speaking on a yacht in october uh hanging out with billionaires like sitting down and having coffee with a billionaire, not even knowing is a bill, he's a billionaire. Like we're right. just talking about life, <laughs> what I do. Then I realized that this individual has created one of the biggest software companies and, and uh, you know, you're sitting there just talking about life. So yeah. you get into these different rooms based off of um, being yourself all the way. You know what I mean? There's mm-hmm. you have five, six years and some people only live in like it's second, third year. If you go right. all the way, who knows who you're going to meet? Who knows what challenges are your way? If you're able to leave your own cave, slay the dragon, you will be able to get your gold and the princess and all the stuff that you have always wanted. It might not come the exact way. Like 10 years ago, I, I wasn't reading books consistently and writing books. I never thought I would be the book guy. But over time, you become shaped into this specific person. And the valuable people out there say, man, you know who I need? I need a book guy. Does anybody know a book guy? Go talk to Mike. That guy's no BS when it comes to it. He thinks just like us. The noise is already cut out. I want to work with him, speeds up the process. And if you can do anything to cut down on noise, but also speed up the intro to sale, to relationship, whatever you can do to do that, it's going to give you an advantage in life. And Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are kind of bouncing around saying, you know what? I don't want to cross that, that threshold. I don't want to piss anybody off. Well, if you're going to piss somebody off, chances are you're going to get someone to love you. And you really want to create a raving tribe. You want a family of people. 10 years from now, you're doing business together. You know where each other stand. And so if they say, hey, Mike, do you want to invest in this dog insurance company? There's a no brainer answer. Yes, I'm in because I know who you are. I know what you stand for. And you're asking me because you know exactly what I stand for. So whatever mm-hmm. you can do to do that, to keep the, the speed uh, on your side, then you can win speed and simplicity. And uh, being controversial may give you uh, a great advantage. So I guess that's a long-winded answer to what is the greatest thing that I've been a part of. Speaking on certain stages, private jets, yacht trips, and uh, maybe just sitting in rooms with multi-multi-millionaires in mansions in Vail, Colorado, talking about how do we create legacy wealth? How do we create generational wealth Mm. to give to my family or to just give to people that need it. You know, when you're at an event and they say, Hey, we're doing a charity. If you want to put some money together and you're able to raise your hand, you know, you're doing something wrong or something right. And you are on the right path. If you can give back other people, notice it and they want to be around other givers. It's wild. Mm -hmm. Man, that's so cool. That's, I mean, it sounds like such an awesome journey. And I, it's funny. Like, I think we, sometimes we're, we're holding our cards back. We're, we're defensive. We have this defensive posture. Even when I go in public, for example, I'm one of those guys I try to walk in and try to look at people. I try to keep my eyes on people and not in a, in a weird way, but in a way where I'm like, Hey, if you and I connect eyes, I'm going to give you a smile. I'm going to come in and I do the Ogmandino silent. I love you. That's basically my method of like walking into a room and people all the time, like I, my neighbors, Every time I meet people, they're always like, dude, you're like such a nice guy, such an outgoing guy or whatever. I'm literally just looking at people and silently saying, I love you. I love, you. I love, you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. What's that guy's name you say? Og Mandino, the greatest salesman. 
Okay. So, so this has a Jedi mind trick. Okay. Because people can feel you even more than they hear you or see you. They can feel you right mm -hmm. right now. I'm sitting here saying a silent. I love you to my audience. Just, I love you. <laughs> so they can feel you. And here's, here's what I do. I walk into a room. It, this, this is where I want you to test this, Mike. When you're in a line that sucks and you're standing in the line, everybody's disgruntled. Nobody's enjoying this line. I want you to silently say, I love you to, especially the person that's holding the line up. Okay. Oh, and oh, then, yes. And then I want you to silently say, I love you to every person following back till it gets back to you and see how the energy transforms. This is, it is seriously, seriously powerful, but it changes your posture. It changes your body chemistry. When you walk into a, a convenience store, generally you're worried about what kind of characters are going to be in that convenience store. What, who's going to be in there that you got to, you know, but if you walk into a convenience store going, I'm going to fucking love every person in this convenience <laughs> store. It is such a different experience for everybody involved. I swear. And you can usually feel that person that walked in the room. That's like, Hey guys, you know, it's got all that warm energy. And you're like, Whoa, who's that person? I like that guy. You can be that guy. You just got to silently say, I love you to everyone. And you got to mean it. You got to be real about it, dude. Real quick. I, I want to oh, talk about that. Yeah. Okay. I'm with you. All right. My energy transformed after I went through the hardships, let's just say 2017. I didn't have running water for about a year in my place because my pipes broke and I have the money to fix it, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So that was the time where I confronted, and you'll love this, Carl Jung's The Shadow. Are you yes. familiar with this? Absolutely. Right. My favorite you, work has been my own shadow work. Yeah. So you will never know yourself until you confront, wrestle, and take over your shadow. You can control your shadow. Mm -hmm. What that means is that the darkest parts about you, stuff that society has said, hey, leave this behind. You don't need this anymore. Well, it's in there for a reason because thousands mm -hmm. of years ago, it was used to keep you alive. So mm -hmm. it's there for a reason, right? When you go to the deepest, darkest parts of your life, you can confront that shadow and now you can become its master. So mm -hmm. when you know yourself and you know, you can be a monster, right? Once you know that, you know, you don't run from monsters, you can actually take over monsters. You now have this sense of gratitude. I'm glad I confronted my shadow. I'm able to see that I can be a monster, but I choose not to be one. That gives you this sense of gratitude. I think a different energy. So when you meet other individuals or you walk into that room, you kind of stand a little differently. You hold mm -hmm. yourself at a higher regard. And now you could say, I love you a little bit easier because, Hey, anything happens. I know I have a monster inside of me that will be able to be to be something to reckon with. You do not even want to touch it, but I choose to be good. So I'm going to say, I love you. I love you. I love you. And people can see that. But when you're weak and you want to hide from people and you don't know what you're made of and you don't want the, the shadow to ever come out, man, now you are at the mercy of the world. And then it gets difficult to actually say, I love you to people because you're always trying to keep the mask up and make sure that other people don't see who you really are. So I like what you're saying. I'm going to use yeah. that more and more. You got to use tough it when I go to certain events, but, uh, <laughs> Oh, it's t Oh, it's going to be tough. Trust me. There are two moments where you're like, well, the, and this also goes back to the prayer. I am that right. The, you know, the meditation, I am that, uh, kind of thing where it's like, we are all one, right. That kind of mentality that we're a part of an energetic thing, but sometimes our separateness makes us feel like we're not. And sometimes when people do certain things like our bacon character, uh, she, he doesn't make us feel like we're part of that at all. Right. So it can be, it, it can be a little confusing at times. We're all one. I am that. Or, are you sure? <laughs> like, I really don't feel like I am, but, uh, anyway, so with that said though, there's, and I love what you talk, touched on with the shadow work. Here's something I really uh, would recommend. And this is, this is the case for facing any kind of fear. Okay. So first of all, um, the reason you're afraid is because you're afraid of an outcome. Mm -hmm. However, if you can get on with it and be okay with whatever outcome, including that one, you can have no fear. Here's an example. I know people that get afraid of turbulence on a plane. 
I get tickled by it. My stomach, I'm like, Ooh, that's kind of, I feel it's kind of funny. And I, and I, and, and I used to be afraid and I grip on the seat and I'd be like, Oh gosh, I cannot wait till we get to the ground. When we get on the ground, I'm literally going to kiss the ground. Not anymore. I don't feel that way at all. And the reason is, is because I've made peace with, I didn't get to choose when I came in. And I sure as hell won't choose when I'm leaving. And if I don't get to choose, why am I sitting here trying to hold on to the seat? I don't even know how to fly this freaking plane. I can't fly it with these seat handles. That's for damn sure. I might as well enjoy the ride. And I just make peace with my God. I say, hey, what a wild ride it's been. I am so grateful for all the joy, yes. all the weirdness, all the hookers, all the drugs, <laughs> all the all the meaning, all the purpose, all the all the joy, all the slumming it up, all the being homeless, all the being wealthy, all the you know whatever parts of my life. I mean, I'm grateful for all of it. I'm not wealthy by the way, but one day I will be. So I know <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and project that out there. I've done all right, but I'm not wealthy. Uh, but all the, all of these things, basically life, all of what life has given to me has created so much rich color. And and this tapestry has been so unique. I'm cool. I'm good. I am good. And so then if I can make peace with that, I have no fear because I'm like, if this thing goes down, it's kind of like Ron White when he was like, I've had three drinks. I'm like, take it down, make sure we hit something hard. You know what I mean? I don't want to walk away from the son of a bitch, you know, like that kind of thing. It's kind of like that. Like I get on with it. And one of the things I've learned is like that, that can work well in, in areas where you go, Hey, look, we don't have a whole lot of control. You can help this thing along. If you will just accept that you won't be able to drive or control this thing, but instead just get on with it and then see where you can, what you can do from that place. Here's the second part. Cause that's, that's like situational fear. Okay. That's situational fear, but then you have this internal fear. This is the shadow that you're defending. You're defending your laziness. You're defending the fact that you don't want to get out of bed. You're defending the fact that you keep spending more money than you make. You're defending the fact that you look at other women and you wish you were more pure. You're defending the fact that you wish you weren't on your porn all the time. You're defending the fact that your penis is small. You're defending the fact that whatever it is, whatever the frick it is, right, that you're defending. And I'm not talking about outwardly defending because generally you're just keeping it all, keeping all your cards back here. But what if you did the same thing and you just got okay with it? Mm. Literally to the point where somebody goes, you know, you're a lazy bastard with a small dick. And you're like, you don't know the half of it. (laughs) Like, I didn't even want to get up this morning. And, you know, like you, like you, like literally, like you could just get, if you could actually say I am lazy. I am this. I am that. I, all these things. And then go, and I fucking don't care. And I love myself. Ooh. And that's okay. The, no one can touch you. You're invincible. You, you cannot totally... be touched. Yes. Not a girlfriend, not a per- No one can touch you. But you actually have to get to a place where you're willing to look at the parts of you that you want to hide. And you go... You motherfucker, you ugly little lazy motherfucker. I love you. And you got to bring it into you and you got to go, I fucking don't care what people say about you. You know, it is. I think it has to do with desperation. I think so many people are desperately wanting to be accepted and loved and and to be seen as a successful and, and happy person. But if you're okay with yourself, you don't need anybody else's approval. And that desperation dissipates. And now your energy is different because you live in a world of abundance. You're not desperate. You you already have what you need. You're not in a state of lack. People can sense that. And I'm telling you, if you are desperate in anything, you're always going to push it away. Whatever you want Mm. is going to just run away from you. Desperate people push away things that they want. But if you have a state of abundance in your mind and you have that attractive mindset, you have that sense of charm and that sense of gratitude, what you want comes to you. There is something to be said about that. And yes, desperation will come from wanting to be thought of having, uh, you know, the perfect life the huge dick, whatever you want to go. For. Right. <laughs> I know it's a little it. raunchy guys, but you that get is. what I'm saying. Right. I mean, I don't mean to be so raunchy, yeah. but that's, I mean, it is something you may be hiding. Like, let's just get on with it. Like, Hey, he's a little dude, but we have fun. Let's go. Like <laughs> it, whatever you, you, you know, it's funny. You're, you're saying, and I love what you're saying too, where it's like, I used to say this, like, 
you know, if I, if you, you were to tell me the, the, what's the kind of car that you want. Right. And I'm like asking just the average guy, I'm like, tell me the, your dream car. Then you want a Ferrari. I want a 488 spider. I've got it on a Lambo, wall, man. Yeah. yeah. I want a Lamborghini and I'm like, okay, girl, tomorrow you have a Lamborghini and I bring it to, where do you live? And they're like, you know, I, I live in an apartment. I'm like, okay, I put a Lamborghini in the apartment complex. You've got it. Now, do you have a joy or a burden? Cause now you're like, Oh shit. What do I do with the Lambo? Get a garage. Like, I don't know where to put it in the garage. I, I, I don't know. I can't afford the maintenance. Cause I drive this thing. Am I just going to drive it till the wheels fall off? Am I get, you know, all of a sudden this thing isn't such a joy. Okay. If I were to ask you, why is it that you want a Lamborghini? Why do you want that? And there, most people are going to say, man, because one, they're good track babes Two, It's going to be awesome. Like the, just the raw horsepower and the sound and the visceral experience get a little popping. I hate this popping. Uh, come on, zoom globalist. <laughs> Let us speak. Damn I'm gonna, you globalists. I'm going to channel my that. Alex Jones. <laughs> Let us speak. Gay frogs. Uh, Gay frogs. It's, <laughs> sometimes when we're here in Texas, we get this, with this, popping noise and the reason is because of the globalist but listen if you're down here at uh austin and you want to go to uh thundercloud subs it's a place i highly recommend it's a delicious place that everybody loves and when they ask you what kind of cheese you want on your sandwich you're going to say american or provolone they always put america first america's always first <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> okay. With that, tangent, please, please, Alex Jones, become the CEO of Twitter, please. Elon, if you can hire Alex, that's going to be the best. Thank you. That would be absolutely epic. So, okay, so we back to Lambo. So you get the Lambo. It's a burden. It's not a joy. It's not a blessing. Um, and and you know, I ask you, what's the reason you want it? You wanted it because you want to feel more confident. You wanted it because you want to attract cool people. You want it because you want to feel powerful. You want it because you want to feel successful. Mm -hmm. Well, what if I asked you to focus on feeling more successful, feeling more powerful, attracting more people, doing those things? What do you think the result of becoming and feeling those emotions more and getting in tune with what it feels like to have that kind of confidence? What do you think that would do? Mm. Well, it'd probably attract the freaking Lambo. Damn right. And that Lambo won't be a burden. It'll be a blessing that you've always wanted because you focused on the right things. Don't focus on the Lambo, man. Focus on the feelings of, of feeling powerful. You know, if there's something inside of you that's holding you back, focus on working on that shadow, mm -hmm. bringing it into your fold and using it as power and being able to talk to guys and be like, man, just like I said, I have empathy for the angry man. I used to be angry as fuck. You know, and, and it totally worked on all that. I had to do a lot of work, had to, it, and it wasn't comfortable. You know, you, you spoke about uh, that dark period of time in your entrepreneurial journey. Was it fun grinding, man, eating bananas and eggs? It was not fun at all. It was pure pain. I'm telling you, friends, family, you doubt yourself. You're not seeing any money, nothing. It's illogical to leave a corporate job and start a business. Totally illogical. But to see something that other people cannot see and stay at it, it's almost a, a confidence booster. Hey, I have something inside of me. There is something that's driving me towards this goal. And I know the average person is not willing to stay at it this long. Mm -hmm. I have something, I can't let it go to waste. And if I do let it go, I will be regretful someday. And I think that regret is the one thing that drove me. You want to get into the psychological aspect. You go back to how rats think. If a rat is starving, it'll go from point A to point B to get the cheese in one, in, at a certain time frame. But if a rat is starving and it's afraid of a cat chasing it, now it's going to get that cheese real fast. So if you can have your wants pulling you and your fears pushing you, now you can get that lifestyle. You can accomplish more in less time. You can become more satisfied with accomplishments. And like you said, you will attract everything you want. All those things that I know are, they're great, right? Lamborghinis, houses, mansions, all that stuff. To me, I'm at a state where I, I, I don't even want that type of, uh, part of my life just yet. I mean, I don't want, I mean, it'd be nice to have a Lamborghini for sure, but I got my 1969 Mustang. It's amazing. I'm good. And when you feel like you're just good, I'm, I'm good. I have everything I need. 
it's amazing what happens. Like you just wake up, you're happier. You track better people in your life. You are not searching for something that like you are in a state of lack. Like we know you're not trying to fill a hole. You're not trying to fill a hole and you're building, you're building on a mound that you already have. You're not just sitting there trying to plug a hole, you know, and this is the truth with raising our kids too, by the way, when you look at characteristics and life skills, responsibility, self-sufficiency, self-reliance, um, being disciplined, when you look at those things, were they pleasant for you to build? Were they pleasant for you to acquire as skills? They suck. <laughs> They freaking suck. It sucks to become responsible. I wanted to create a shirt that says adulting fucking sucks. Like it <laughs> does. It's way cooler to be a kid and not have to worry about that stuff. But we do have to grow up. And once you're on the other side and you have self-discipline, self-reliance, all you when, when you have those things, you're like, I never trade it for being dependent you know. again. It's I'll the, never your pan, right? It's the Peter it, pan. It's it the happens. lost boys, no responsibility, transferring over and then realizing Ah, oh, thank God I did. Thank God. Yeah. So it's, so, so we have, you know, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, if you want to be out there and you want to put yourself out there, you've got to be willing to throw yourself in that fire so you can become something new, something hardened, something with new skin. You got to kind of become, you got to go, it's like the butterfly, man. You got to liquefy your body in the chrysalis. Hmm. You know, it doesn't get to stay a caterpillar. You don't get to hold both ends of the spectrum. You have to be, you have to move through it. Now, once you're the butterfly, you can do, you, you got freedom, but it's, it's not fun. It's definitely not fun. I mean, I went through my, like I said, I went, I was homeless, man. I was freaking homeless asking people for money. It's awful. It's terrible. Look at you now, man. You're so articulate. You're clear. Oh, you're you. lucid, man. It's amazing. Well, I done. appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much, man. Well, we've been doing a lot of work. I've been dedicated to the work. That's what I'm saying. It's like, get okay with those parts of you that you're trying to hide. I've gotten to a place where I've gotten okay with that. I've done a lot of that work. And when I said integrate and bring it into the fold, if you can love those parts of yourself that you're worried about other people touching, it's because you don't love it. It's because you're trying to reject it yourself and you don't want anyone to see it. Cause if they see it, they're going to touch that thing that you're trying to reject in your own being. But if you're willing to say, fuck, I kind of, okay, whatever. I love my fat self. I love my whatever self. And you can get okay with that. Then you can actually change and do and become whatever you want. Mike, I've kept you way too long. I just want to tell you, thank you, dude. Thank you so much for this. This has been fun. <laughs> Dude, um, I had a great time. I love getting on podcasts and just talking about philosophy. Can I can I read something? Uh, of course, from my, my book. I, it, it just falls sure. in line. I want it. It's sort of maybe a, a, a pitch for the book, but I think it's just perfect. You uh, talking about philosophy. This is not a common thing when it comes to podcasts. Usually, I talk about how to write a book and all that, and some of that gets you know old. But talking about this just brings life into into me throughout the day. So I really appreciate what you. Uh, what, what you brought me on to talk about, man. And I'm going to read off. This is the last two paragraphs of my book called million dollar book coming out this month in May. And, uh, I think it's perfect. Okay. So this is called, uh, the chapter is really just the conclusion and it's really about finding yourself. So many people know him as the father of Western philosophy, but I may move this over, but they don't realize, all right, I will leave you with an incredible story of Socrates. Many people know him as the father of Western philosophy, but they don't realize he never wrote a word about his life. Not one. It was one of his students, a man named Plato, who did all of that for him. As you can see, even Socrates had a ghostwriter. Socrates was a former war hero whom the government officials hated for being outspoken for, uh, and inquisitive. He would ask townspeople questions with the sole intention of getting them to think for themselves. This angered the people in power. After they had enough, they put him on trial, found him to be guilty of corrupting youth, corrupting the youth, and sentenced him to death. In a strange twist, they ended up releasing him with a condition that if he doesn't leave the city within six months, they would put him to death. Many wealthy people in the different towns around him begged for him to leave and even offered him a place to stay. He could have escaped town. He could have escaped death. When Socrates refused, the, government's, the government summoned him and forced him to drink the hemlock poison. Just before his death, he was asked, why 
didn't you leave? His response was profound. He refused to run from the truth. Socrates admitted he could not run from who he really was inside. Now that's courage. That's bookworthy. That's what happens when you know yourself. You can't run from who you really are. Do you want to be a force to reckon with in this world? Do you want to be completely free? Do you really want to attract wealth? If so, you will need to know yourself. Start writing down who you were. Then start writing down who you are now. Then write down who you will become. The hero story is one of transformation. The moment you see your book in your hands, it will become your sword. And we both know you have a dragon to slay. I can only imagine where the adventure will take you from here. Your million dollar journey is going to be one for the books. Right on. You're right on. <laughs> that is so cool, man. I'm going to get a book with you. We're going to do a deal, Mike. Love it. Um, I have a couple, I have two books in me. I probably have a lot of books in me, but I have two for sure that have been brewing for a long time. And uh, let's make something happen. Thank you so much for your time and your energy, what you're up to in the world, uh, your influence, your courage, your willing to be, uh, your willingness to be authentic. Um, I had a lot of fun with you, man. Hey, same here. Let's talk uh, afterwards. I really want, now that we know each other, I'll be sending you Jordan Peterson, Jim Rohn quotes, Socrates quotes daily. So uh, get ready for that. All my favorite stuff. <laughs> Awesome, dude. Thank you so much. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you've received some value from it, please share it with other dads and consider leaving us a review on your favorite podcast platform. And we'll see you in the next episode. Looking for support with your fatherhood journey? Go to BeDadly.com and take our Dadly Disposition quiz and learn helpful insights on how you can overcome power struggles with your kids. 